let me ask you, ask the audience this question if it is even possible to limit self dealing in a scarce world where needs are fine where means are finite but needs are insatiable uh, it it seems we we are caught in some kind of bad equilibrium Welcome everyone. Hello. 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 Can we get a little energy from the audience? Yeah. Hey, there we go. Thank you. It's, Thank fr you. it's Friday afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Evening. <laughs> yes, yes. It's so nice to see all you beautiful people out here today. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. We're very excited for this panel on identifying and correcting perverse incentives. We're super duper grateful for you all coming out. We're very grateful for Indie Bio for hosting us in their beautiful space. Thank you, Indie Bio. Also grateful to BioCaptivate, Yan and Lewis, for partnering with us. I'm Alan Sakyan, the host of Simulation, which you may have seen before, where we interview some of the greatest minds alive. Ron Vagas is our producer director. He's back there doing our camera for today. And Unfortunately, for those that may have seen um, that Esther and Aza were both on the panel originally, but then Esther messaged us with an emergency and Aza was sick, so um, really unfortunate they weren't able to make it, but we did our best to find replacements last minute, and we're going to have an incredible evening together. For the last minute changes, actually, Lewis has offered everyone in the audience a free ticket to his Biology is Not Programming Introduction to DNA, RNA, and Proteins course that he's going to be teaching. Um, that date is still to be determined, but you all um, can reach out to BioCaptivate and for attending that event. I actually have had an incredible experience attending the first class that Lewis uh, taught, and I thought it was one of the best syntheses of biology, making it really relatable. So highly recommend that. So also, um, and we'll move to the, yeah, to the next slide to see that um, the Yoon Family Foundation um, helped, um, they're, they're, in, they're incredible um, people. They have a book that they released called Interdependent Capitalism and make sure that everyone gets a copy of the book on the way out. It's right next to um, Lewis right there. It's again, just one of those books that really puts it so well what's going on with our world with those perverse incentives and solutions for our way to to move forward and why they originated in the first place as well. And they are also behind the incentive prize on incentives. And that's an incentive competition designed to nurture innovations that promote a better future for all through inclusive stakeholding, vested interdependent interests, and goal congruence. And that challenge invites social innovations from any discipline, including economics, politics, arts, technology, and sciences, including the social sciences. And the Website is there, the incentive prize on incentives.org. And if you put in the code 71919 into the how did you hear about us field, um, that would help move the, ch the identify that you found out about it through us. And the challenge runs from July 1st, 2019 to December 1st, 2019. And a select number of winners will be chosen to receive 5,000 US dollars each for the best proposal submitted in accordance with the terms on the website. So the deadline for submissions is October 31st. So remember from all of these things that we're going to be talking about with identifying correct perverse incentives, you can submit a proposal to the incentive prize on incentives. All right. And just a couple quick thoughts before we start. This big human experiment that's unfolding on planet Earth is both marvelous and fragile. And there's no guarantees with the immense amount of civilizations that have collapsed before us that we are able to handle the godlike technologies that we are creating. Our maturity, ethics, and wisdom need to skyrocket if we plan to make it through these challenging times. We know thanks to much of the globalized in infrastructure and incentive systems, people have been pulled out of poverty at unprecedented rates and, qual and quality of life is increasing around the world. We also acknowledge that many of these incentive systems have evolved self-dealing tendencies, embedded growth obligations, oligopoly dynamics, lack of inclusive stakeholding with non-represented entities like the ecology we all reside in, and future generations who would like to inherit a well-functioning earth not polluted with problems. We have tools ranging from ancient wisdom to new technologies to correct these perverse incentives and ensure greater propensity to make it through these challenging times. 
This is what our panel conversation will be about tonight, and I ask you for a favor. Embody a couple words into your essence with me. The first word is nuance. And one of the, if you've you've seen any of my social profiles, that's my middle name now, I changed it to nuance. Purposely, I'm trying to subconsciously help people move into non-binary thinking, this multivariate mindsets. Equanimity, so staying even keel, calm, and composed. Gratitude for life that we are even here and there's something rather than nothing for every breath, for every drink of water, for every bite of food, gratitude for us being here together and humility. So again, I welcome you, extend deep gratitude and wish you all fruitful experience with our event. So let's start with panelist introductions. Again, thank you, thank you everyone for coming, super duper grateful. All right, can we all maybe take a deep breath in together? Let's see one more. It's so nice to be present with you all tonight. All right, Poe Brunson is the first one here to my left, to your right. His wide-ranging published works have earned national awards and best-selling titles. He's a storyteller and futurist, reconceptualizing complex challenges into more elegant forms to broaden understanding and highlight priorities. Next to my left and your right is Nishan Degnorain. He's focus on climate and ocean issues is unprecedented. He founded and shared the World Economic Forum Special Initiative on Oceans, wrote Soul of the Sea in the Age of the Algorithm, and is working on a new international UN treaty on life in the oceans. Next up is Maya. Maya Lockwood. Maya Lockwood empowers entrepreneurs' voices, emotional intelligence, and leadership skills. She oversees IndieBio's communication strategy and community building around content, thought leadership, media events, speaking engagements, and strategic partnerships. Next up is Parikshit Sharma, is a principal at IndieBio, doing analysis, market research, modeling, and automation for their portfolio and data pipeline. Also actively works with the portfolio companies on building data rooms and techno economic modeling. And last up is Louis Metzger, who is co-founder of BioCaptivate and chief scientific officer of Tierra Biosciences, believing that the pre- Precise engineering of biology will enable a coming revolution in how humans live, work, and interact with our planet. All right, let's start things off by asking you, what is the most first principle or upstream root issue with these perverse incentives? And feel free, whoever would like to start things off. You want to go, Bob? All right, well, upstream, way, way upstream for me, and one I spend a lot of time thinking about, um, is that, uh, that the material world is visible and our internal worlds are not necessarily visible. And the net result of this is that our status systems are primarily based around uh, the visible world, and it leads us to seek property, money, status symbols, uh, use a lot of the world's natural resources in a way, and that we don't have a way to essentially display our, the value of our internal states of mind. Now, my f- dear friend Maya may remember everybody's name, and I can't remember their name. She may have incredibly wild dreams, and mine are pedestrian, uh, but there's no way to have status in a sort of social way around that. And, and, and on the deepest level, uh, way, way, so this is very, very upstream, right? But is this fundamental problem of how can we make people value the things that we all individually try to value, we all t- individually try to reward with each other and talk about as being super important, but we don't have, you know, you can't like, I can't just like post on Facebook, like this was my dream last night, it was awesome, you be jealous of my dreams. But if I buy a condo over the ballpark, and I, it costs $2 million, and I post a beautiful photo of the ballpark from the view of my condo, you can all watch. And I think that fundamental element of how to bring our interior worlds out and more visible is, uh, is one dimension that's way, way upstream that I find myself thinking about a lot. Thank you. That was beautiful, a a great place to start. Um, I think that we need a reward system or uh, incentives that recognize people who have taken 100% responsibility for their lives, for their happiness, for their emotional uh, intelligence, and 
I don't know if we have anything like that yet, but 100% responsibility. I think I would, I would agree there, and I was just thinking about reverse incentives in how, how they relate to, one, me being a millennial where it feels like old people are giving us a future we don't want, and two, me being a third world or a global south citizen where it seems the post-World War II economy seems to favor developed nations and there's this cycle of emerging developing that we just haven't been able to break. And I think it, it comes from caring. Ironically, how much we care, how much institutions care, uh, that has bred a form of paternalism. And I, I, I think that's central uh, to institutions at the family level as well as the global le level. So paternalism and caring, ironically, is breeding perverse incentives in my mind. And just to build on this and, and the caring, um, I know a lot of you here have, um, have got a big science uh, background and science focus. Um, and so uh, several months ago, uh, we had a, a meeting um, in India with the Dalai Lama. And one of the challenges that we talked, we were talking about some of the big challenges from a kind of science or spirituality perspective. And one of the big challenges is climate change, oceans, what's going on with our environment. And we asked, well, do you have, you know, do you, where do you see hope? Where do you see change actually emerging um, in this world of, of um, you know, turmoil and turbulence? And he said, well, we actually, he actually thinks that we have fundamentally misunderstood science. I said, well, what, what do you mean by that? He said, well, our science basis, it's still based on Darwinism, um, you know, a concept 200 years ago um, where you see something very dramatic, you know, a lion attacking a gazelle or kind of an orca you know, attacking a penguin. So it's extremely dramatic and it's based on survival of the fittest. And that mindset of survival of the fittest in the natural world then percolated down into our social systems, our political systems, our economic systems, where we encourage competition, you know, dog eat dog. So, well, actually, that's based on a, a misunderstanding of science. And I'm sure there's a lot more scientists over here who will correct me. He said, um, when you actually look at certain species and genes that have actually survived for many thousands of years, these are species that exist in herds, in shoals, in communities, an interdependency of different species as well. So actually when you look at survival, although you know, one is very dramatic, we're really talking about survival of the kindest. And as well as survival of the kindest, you know, can we bring about a new age of empathy? where we can actually create this new value system that we'd, we'd like to see. So I thought that was very powerful and profound in terms of how do we just move beyond the, you know, the last 200 years of, of, of a certain mindset to a new paradigm of compassion and, and kindness. So I would see a major upstream determinant um, of some of the perverse incentives that we deal with uh, being this idea of a runaway objective function. So especially in the age of the algorithm, uh, we're in a position where we can really efficiently optimize the extraction of resources or the creation of wealth, however one wishes to define that, uh, and so many other objectives. And in doing some things perhaps too efficiently, um, we're undermining our future and creating conditions where maybe we've over-optimized. Uh, and this, this is in so many different fields. So I think this runaway objective function um, optimization that runs throughout uh, modern economies, academia, uh, many other fields uh, is, is uh, one root, of, uh, one cause of perverse incentives. seems to be that this idea that the internal state of how one feels with their own well-being, with the family, the community, and the world, that that needs some sort of a, there needs to be some sort of an incentive for us to figure out how to make that incentivized for people to talk about and to want to share, and also for people to rank themselves up in terms of their own divine alignment connection with their purpose and with the world's trajectory. Now, indigenous tribes from around the world have for the longest time been talking about that this first principal issue of our disconnection from nature, from what sustains us, is directly reflected in the issues that we have in our civilization. Where do you believe that the disconnection from nature, this first principle of indigenous wisdom, lies with the issue we have with perverse incentives. Well, 
Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I, I, I mean, I think what's interesting is um, we're starting to see this recognition of different value systems that exist. And um, I know in, in the US, um, I know one of the Native American cultures here talk about the seventh generation principle, really thinking much more longer term about how the seventh generation judge decisions that are, that are being made. And somehow we still have a economic system that's based on um, a, a GDP. And GDP is a very modern co concept. It's only been around for 70 or 80 years, uh, post Second World War as a way to kind of measure um, instruments. And even central banks are a relatively modern concept. Um, so I think part of the bridge is how do we actually start harmonizing our institutions with some of the other value systems that we've had? You know, why can there not be um, you know, measures beyond GDP um, value systems institutions that link to our value of our elders or wisdom um, or the value of nature for example um, so I think that those institutions will need to be modernized in, in sync with some of our kind of ancient cultures so I mean one one thing that I think uh, is the indigenous people knew uh, and know um, that many modern societies have partially forgotten uh, is the value of what's evolved in deep time in nature. And if you think about green chemistry, or you, actually many of the pharmaceuticals that you all probably have used, uh, maybe they've even saved your life uh, because they were an antibiotic and you would have died of sepsis uh, if it had it not you know, been for that treatment. These are natural products. Lots of them are natural products. So that means that they're made by enzymes encoded by DNA in organisms and you know, plants, bacteria, fungi, all organisms, all different types of organisms in nature. And I think that looking back towards what's in nature for an added value uh, of a species diversity and, and a value beyond ecotourism in terms of preserving beautiful and diverse uh, uh, ecosystems is something that we learn from, from indigenous cultures. And you know, the field of natural product chemistry is quite dependent, has been quite dependent on indigenous wisdom. And in fact, uh, you know, many of their medical interventions have been borne out by solid science. So I think that that's, that's one thing that in my field I think a lot about. Well, uh, I have two thoughts on, on this. One relates to property and um, Fundamentally, like today I was talking and someone was asking me, do you think biotech is like um, I, IT startups? And, and I said, no, you know, it's not the next, this next decade is not the same. And the most fundamental difference is IP. Uh, in the software and internet world, you maybe have IP on your algorithms and some of your chipset designs and this and that, but people basically just move past it really fast, don't care, not that big of a deal. You don't really corner a market because you have IP. In biotech, you do. And in fact, if you're a biotech startup, you have to be very nimble around other people's IP to try to figure out how to move forward and take out a market. In fact, and, and it's necessary, it's oddly necessary, you know, for our 105 companies that we've graduated so far, Virtually all of them had IP, and if they didn't, we couldn't have funded them, and they couldn't have gotten follow-on funding from other ventures. It was necessary to extract these amazing solutions for human and planetary health out of this sort of idea stage and the research stage and to commercialize them. So it's necessary, but it's also sort of tragic uh, because this fundamental element of property and defending property um, means that even for a lot of the solutions we'd want in the world, the people literally own them and own the right to use those, and own them, certainly use them in a commercial, in any sort of commercial venue. Um, I'm reminded of that uh, Abraham Maslow, before he created his famous sort of triangle of hierarchy of needs, he was sort of working on it, had this idea of it, and he went to visit a friend who was an uh, ethnologist and anthropologist studying the Blackfoot Indians in Canada, and he went there and he, they had their own sort of triangle of needs, but he kind of inverted it. And so what he took as our sort of Western idea of our hierarchy of needs, he simply inverted it. And what's really clear there, where we think of this idea of uh, respecting your elders, or hanging on to what your elders knew. Like, we, we have this sort of mysticism around that concept, but in fact, if you think of it like, more like there at the level, like, your elders taught you, eat this bush, don't eat that one, it'll kill you. 
this is how you catch a fish. Not like that, you'll die. Like, don't eat that. It looks yummy, but it's not good for you. You had to, it was a matter of, when we say existential threat, it was an existential threat. There was no books, there was no Wikipedia, there was no nature reserve to store all this information. You literally had to remember what your elders told you, or you would die. And that we've mysticized that, but not really understood that when we basically learned to record information and pass that on by other means, we didn't have to. It wasn't an existential threat anymore to pay attention to what your elders said. And today, we think of existential not even as a threat to our existence, but almost the opposite. Like, I don't have any threats to my existences, and therefore, I'm kind of drifting in the world and lack purpose. And we've sort of inverted it just as much as, as Maslow did in how we think about these things. And so I think fundamentally, a lot, even just like recording of information itself would arguably have changed that paradigm. You didn't have to listen to your elders if I could go look it up on Wikipedia rather than asking dad to remember what he said. Yeah, go going back to nature, I think we, we will have to reclassify this, this divide between urban and nature are urban spaces and natural spaces, I should say, because most of humanity, as we know it, is going to live in cities. And, you know, one... Maybe. Uh, Maybe. Trends are moving there, but also we have this deep yearning to be out of the massive concrete jungles, too. Uh, yeah, and I, I think, again, going, going back to this idea of the love of nature and appreciation of its mystical beauty or this romanticization. If you look at most tribes or primal cultures today, they, they are living in this hybrid urban rural dichotomy where they're very disengaged from the aesthetic value of nature. I, I think of Indian shrines where there's so much plastic around it and actually I, <laughs> I, I'm from the, from the Himalayas and, and once I went on a hike where the temple groundskeeper said that they don't care about the plastic because they're disengaged from the aesthetics of the plastic. And I also think about birds that are more successful in urban environments as predators uh, because there's just so much food out here uh, than, than birds that live in bushes. So just re rethinking our environment uh, and this urban nature divide, I think, is, is is very important and and you know just disengaging the aesthetics is is also very 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 important to if we are to identify this perverse incentive uh is is my take so, somewhere down to the use value versus the exchange value of things we we have to deconstruct it more i don't i don't <coughs> claim to have an answer but yeah i think that's that's part of the problem here maya thoughts as well on indigenous wisdom um, well, just one thing comes to mind, and that is that we don't have initiation rights to become el uh, to become adults, and so a, a lot of indigenous cultures they do have those ceremonies in which they are strongly rooted in nature that help people um, become. And they learned that from their elders as well. Our communities are involved and we are disconnected from each other, from our communities, from our families, and therefore we're also connect disconnected from nature. Yeah, it's like third graders with godlike technologies. We haven't initiated ourselves into the deepest spiritual wisdom that they know, and yet we get to play with the technologies that are being democratized in the hands of everyone on the planet that have so much power now. Yeah. Um, what is the best tool for identifying the perverse incentives? <laughs> I don't know. Lewis, come on. You've moved a lot of this one. All right. Well, to put it simply, I think one could get a good start by following the money. Um, and uh, um, not that money is bad, but I do think, you know, I, I really think that Poe's comments earlier about um, how does one signal one's inner wealth? 
um, uh, and how do groups of people signal their collective additive or multiplicative wealth of their you know minds and, and passions about things they're trying to create um, and it's different than than accruing money it's but not incompatible uh, but I think that I'll give you an example so I like to use the example of universities and um, uh, I've seen some bad things happen in uh, research universities uh, and in how big academic research is, is funded and conducted. And uh, again, it's not all black and white, but there are big perverse incentives there. And if you follow the money, you will see those perverse incentives. Uh, so long as graduate students and postdoctoral trainees are cheaper than robots, they're going to be transferring small volumes of clear liquids into other small volumes of clear liquids and learning not very much from that. You know, it's 95% prep time, 5% collecting real data and thinking about it. Uh, and so there is a perverse incentive. Grants uh, have large overheads taken by universities. So for instance, University X will get a grant, or a professor at University X will get a grant for a million dollars for basic research. 500K of that is typically taken off the top by the university, ostensibly to keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. But then one sees a proliferation of assistant associate deputy deans of this or that, and you know, an other wastage that really doesn't have to do with education. And you can see how grant harvesting and turning, turning the other way when fraudulent data are used to obtain grants is something that's incentivized. So that's, that's one example, but you, know, you follow the money and you, you can see uh, in that and many other cases. Well, I was thinking along the same lines, but I don't know if the Kung Fight the right word for it, which is this sort of, um, uh, you know, beware the nobility of first appearances. And the way that universities fund themselves on by taking half of on or half again of each every grant is is, is sort of uh, the NIH gives thirty nine billion dollars every year to our universities to do science work. It's really important. It drives everything and all the solutions that we need. It's fantastic. But there are these sort of things you wouldn't see until you look at it. You know, I, I was very excited when uh, with the U.S. we created the forty five Q carbon sequestration tax credit. $50 for sequestering a ton, $35 for just capturing. But then I looked up who's the actual number one user of this, and it's the Petronova facility in Houston where the Wa Parish boiler number eight burns coal. And they are, so they're coal burning. They capture it, good for them. They pipe it 82 miles east into Louisiana where they use it as fracking, the new fracking material, to push up yet more oil. So the, the, the oil field there, which was doing something like 3, 000, 3, 3, only 300 barrels a week, is now doing 15,000 barrels a week or something. So, and they're getting paid the whole way to do that, and the U.S. gave them a $190 million grant to build the, build the, the whole sequestration and pipeline facility. So the nobility of it is fantastic, right? Like it's a great thing. Then you'll go look at the number one user, and I don't even know if it's good or bad. Nishan, maybe tell me out here, but like, it doesn't feel like that was the outcome we wanted to to create yet more fossil fuel extraction with it. Um, I don't know if they were extremely cunning or they planned this in advance or what it is, but it is. There's definitely a sort of a of a you know beware the wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah. I was actually, before you said money, it's good, good you reminded me, I was thinking of data, but now that we have money, I'll, I'll add to that. We, we, we don't have to think about money, per se, rather the time value of money. I think a perverse incentive, time. the time, time value, value of money, okay. capitalism as it's set up, works between five to 25 years. Discounted cash flows and interest rates work only work between five to twenty that's when they're meaningless and if you look at capitalism today or globalization today we have not reconciled our past we are thinking of universal basic income to offset future inequality but we don't think about how that stems from historic inequality Right? And so thinking about time value of money is, I think, very, very important. Something we are very bad at. 
uh, and something we have not thought of. And I have only learned uh, working at a VC firm where there's this concept of a cap table or a capitalization table, which is the spreadsheet of who owns how much over time. And uh, at IndieBio, we have a saying, we, we'll only fund a company with a clean cap table. So where the skin in the game from the day an idea is thought of till the day someone is funded is proportionate to effort. And it seems the world is been investing on a faulty cap table. And you know, capitalists have figured it out. No one in the valley funds a, a startup with a faulty cap table. If the history of your startup and effort and talent is disproportionate, you're not funded. But global trade, as it been carried out, has blood, has a very, very gruesome past that we don't t talk about. So we've been funding our world uh, on a faulty cap table. So that's that's what I would I would say. Time value of money is something I want to learn more about. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm sure some of the audience members. I'm just looking at how they probably have some views on perverse incentives and how does that could actually contribute. So, but you know, my two cents worth is uh, we'll have workshop time to do that. Yes. Fantastic. Exactly. Um, so I think talent is a good indicator. You know, when you look at the top of organisations, whether it's the public sector, the private sector, um, you you wonder whether this the talent at the top level really reflects um, the talent in society. You know, is it a fair representation on every metric that we look at um, of of society? And um, you know, linked to that, the other point is. Um, around certain uh, st stereotypes in terms of, you know, just challenging certain assumptions. Um, I think, um, so in one of my roles, I'm an advisor to the Chinese government on, on their ocean and, and climate strategies, uh, one of three foreigners um, in, in that capacity. And what's interesting is right now, you know, we talked about fracking, you talked about, you know, the US and historically it has been Western nations, it's been Europe, it's been the US, Canada, Australia, who's been um, leading the charge around environmental stewardship. Um, but the scale of what we're facing with climate change is so acute. You know, within 12 years, we hit these tipping points. And I'm from a small island called Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. I've just come back this week. And it's devastating. I mean, when I look at that, uh, I was uh, around some of the reefs, which are which are our most pristine marine parks. We used to have one of the largest brain corals in the world, probably about the size of this, this room. Only 2% is alive today. And 10 years ago, this was vibrant, full of color. So even in the country that I'm from, in 12 years, we're going to hit that tipping point where um, I will not have any coral reefs and that's a third of my G GDP you know the protection of our um, coastlines our hotel sectors so this is a, a very a, this existential crisis I'm sure if the US had a third of its GDP at risk there'll be a lot more activity than building fracking stations um, and, and so what's interesting is um, you know uh, what is the role of democracy in this? Um, and we're finding countries like the US, obviously um, everyone's followed what's happening politically here, like the UK, like Europe, um, demo democratic countries are not moving as fast as they need to on some of the big challenges. And so one of the really important questions we've got to put on the table is, um, are there gonna be transition? Are we going to naturally progress to a cleaner world using market mechanisms, using democracy, or would there be another mechanism to do that? And what's interesting about China is that China is, a, very large. B, they're building the Belt and Road Initiative that will touch 60% um, you know, of global GDP, a third of the world's population, over 68 countries, for better or for worse. Um, and yet they're moving a lot more aggressively than Europe or the US in terms of climate and environmental standards. Um, and so that, I think, is something that we'll have to grapple with at some stage. What are the trade-offs and values? Um, but at least on one metric, on the environmental side, although there's a lot of stereotype in the US media, when you actually go to China and see the progress that's been happening almost on a quarterly basis, it is actually very profound. So um, I think that's something just to, to be aware of as well. Maya? No, no. Okay, and then, yeah, I'm curious on like which, if when you think about things as code, which, ex which, which, which governments and which organizations and which companies around the world are running the best code to be stewards of the planet? How do we take that and build on top of that? What do we do to correct self-dealing institutions and increase kin altruism? So the self-dealing institution, and it's really well explained in the Yoon Family Foundation's Interdependent Capitalism, um, 
self-dealing can be thought of like when in the days of the kin tribe as Poe was explaining to you with his incredible humor as well, that you would tell a story to someone else for the benefit of the other person because you would want to make sure they don't die eating the wrong thing. Nowadays, you have all of the propaganda that's occurring with food, self-dealing food company, self-dealing physician, self-dealing everybody in so many ways. And so what they're doing is they're just propagating a meme to try and earn more money for themselves instead of something that's actually helpful to you. So how do we, how do we correct those self-dealing institutions and also how do we increase kin altruism across the global scale? Yes, ma'am. Well, I think June would say the media is a good place to start and the storytelling that we choose to share. So if you're talking about how, uh, say, for example, a food uh, company um, peddles their product to people, um, you want to start telling the story of truth and whether it does contain the things that it does contain. And um, that's... You know, it's, it's, it comes down to the narrative, Poe. Don't look at me, man. <laughs> I don't know the answer to this one. I mean, this is really, I mean, I know I live in this world, and I've been a member of the media for a long time, and I, other than, like, trying to be honest and tell it like it is, I don't, I see I see this insane problem. It, today, I mean, every organization is a media company, and they put out a message that makes them look good. And there's not one that doesn't do it, not one. And maybe they write some, you know, occasional mea culpas or whatever and apologies, but usually not. And uh, and and you're, to your to your point, like it's one thing that like you lobbyists and like, you don't even lobbyists. You just you know put out your message and spend it. I don't I don't have the answer to it. I I really don't. I wish I did, but. Do you guys have answers for it? Um, yeah, I mean, I will say that it's it sounds easier than you think because every and we often do this as truth and fake or as science and anti-science, but every scientific breakthrough fundamentally is anti-science. It is violating what scientists thought was possible, and it is proving that what they thought was impossible is possible. So when people make scientific breakthroughs, they are, a lot of people read it and think, oh, see, science didn't know all it thought it did. And so every scientific breakthrough, when they're happening more and more and more, continues to emphasize this message, which is that science thought they knew what they were doing, but they actually don't know what they're doing. And so it, it fundamentally creates this psychological landscape where it's up for grabs. And so it's not as simple as, as people think, you know. Uh, downstairs we graduate 11 15 companies every time and they're doing something people thought was impossible that the NIH wouldn't give them a grant because you can't possibly do that that doesn't it's gonna break the laws of physics they would say and then it turns out to be true possible so when you're living with that is at one end of the spectrum as a problem I don't know how you define the difference between um, stuff we think is good and noble and stuff that shouldn't exist I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure I'll be able to follow <laughs> that in terms of the uh, the death. But I, I do think on the self-serving institutions, I think what, you know one of the questions we face is kind of where on the spectrum we're going to be. So your point about you know is every organization a media organization? There is certain power towards uh, transparency and truth. And um, for the longest time, it was the media um, and with a broker. And now we're obviously in this era of um, you know. Twitter or Facebook, so the lowest common denominator. So do we rely on the madness or the wisdom of the crowds um, and mob rule to actually make decisions, whether you're a private or a public organization? Or do, do, at the other end, do you need these these mandarins of kind of technical experts actually making judgments for us? Or is there some kind of halfway house? And how do you decide where that halfway house is? I think that's 
at the core of what the, the question is. And I don't, I, I certainly don't have a good answer uh, to that. But I think, um, you know, economics t tells us there's infinite wants and, um, you know, finite needs. Um, and so, or finite resources. And so, um, you know, if it's, if everything is decentralized to um, everybody to expressing their opinions, we're never going to truly, I know Peter Diamandis talks a lot about abundance and this era of abundance, but are we, are we ever going to meet everybody's needs? And so, you know, who has that mechanism to actually control who gets what in that redistribution? I think that's um, a key question, but, you know, trust is going to be absolutely core to that. So, uh, on the subject of self-dealing, how to combat self-dealing, again, I'll go back to the example of uh, funding of academic research, uh, well, and, and corporate research through government, academic, corporate, sort of three, you know, corner, you know, triangular uh, uh, funding approaches. The problem, I think, and is regulatory capture. So if you look at NIH uh, study sections, so the panels of people who review grants to the National Institute of Health, uh, they're disproportionately professors, they're disproportionately uh, high-ranking, long-serving professors, and not surprisingly, such professors have the highest uh, um, rates of funding of their own grants. And so it's, it's easy to look at someone's nascent research program and say, well, that's not established compared to my own. Uh, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to fund that, but, per, you know, Professor XYZ, you know, down the hall from me has 50 grad students and 20 postdocs and cranks out papers, you know, that research is more precedented and more fundable, more, you know, more achievable. And um, uh, so I think that the solution to this is, is not to remove senior professors from study sections, uh, but it's to supplement those study sections with people with other perspectives. And I, I would go so far as to put research trainees at some, at some percentage on study sections because they, their lives are in many ways affected by these grants being funded. And so if you're going to bring in all the stakeholders uh, to make this more sustainable, I think you should bring in all the stakeholders uh, to some extent. And so I'd like to see, to sum it up, uh, uh, you know, us moving from regulatory capture to an expansion of regulatory responsibility. Again, I, I have no solutions here, but I would echo what Nishan brought up, this concept of scarcity, and self-dealing is the best response to scarcity. If someone tells me Bank of America has a million left, I am going to run to Bank of America, and everyone should run for Bank of America, to, towards Bank of America. It's a negative, destable equilibrium. And as long as I, I would let me ask you, ask the audience this question: If it is even possible to limit self-dealing in a scarce world where needs are fine, where means are finite but needs are insatiable, uh, it it seems we we are caught in some kind of bad equilibrium, uh, and we know the answer to a bank run is to tax people. Ironically, not the banks but the people. So let's. Let's think in the framework of where there exists scarcity and where can we eliminate this and who, who we tax uh, for what purpose to eliminate this best response because I'm currently, and that's the, the only thing I can think of is if scarce then safeguard yourself. So you know that, that scarcity is central to me and I, I just want to even see if there can be ever no scarcity is is what I'm wondering. Maya, thoughts on this topic? No? Okay. <clears throat> and how about, we talked about this a little bit, but we have this massive economic machinery that is continuing to just churn and churn and churn on a daily basis. We created a beast that doesn't have a pause button and it also doesn't have a recalibrate with a little rudder to help us recalibrate it in a different direction. And so this machinery continues to move, so it seems as though the, it's to find new markers for flourishing, new markers for well-being, new markers for figuring out how well someone's doing on the internal, how well they're doing with nature. What are some of these new markers of the future, and how do we measure them? How do we make them common around our world? 
I mean, I, th I think you're spot on. One of the biggest challenges of our time, if you look at the next 30 years, is how does the middle income countries progress? Um, because if everybody aspires, you know, India, China, Indonesia, Brazil, aspires to a European Union or a US standard of living at $30,000 or $40,000 per capita, we burn through four times our planetary resources. Right. And that's a challenge within the next three decades. And if you think about the 1950s in the US, the American dream, you know, the, the mod cons of the refrigerator, the microwave, the, the suburban car and, and the commute, um, that's still permeating on televisions and mass media around the world. You know, whether you watch Bollywood or Chinese TV or Indonesian TV, we haven't yet defined what that um, the China dream is or the India dream or the Brazil dream. And that's going to be absolutely core as a marker for what our new economic system should look like. You know, can we look at an economic system that's dependent more on access rather than consumption? You know, do, should we be consuming, you know, it's, it's also ironic at you know, a time that we talk about scarcity in certain planets, we have this obesity crisis in the Western world. So there's clear um, discrepancies in our economic systems in the US and, and Europe, the, the wealthy world versus the global South. So how do we define the, um, the new dream um, for a, you know, if you're a 16 year old in in Indonesia today or in, in China today, what does that 35-year-old you know, life look like for them um, in terms of children, lifestyle, weather, consumption? Um, what does that look like at a $20,000 per capita uh, measure? That hasn't yet been defined. So that's, I think, at, at the center part of your question, what we need to look for. So it, uh, that's this is really interesting because I was going to say uh, lower quartiles income growth. And just like late last night, two in the morning, I was looking at news saying, oh, you know, wage growth is over 3% again. Finally, it's going up. And I was sort of like, really? <laughs> like, I got to look at this by the quartiles. And it's a different story. You see that in the top quartile, wage growth is terrific. And in the lower, other quartiles, it is going up. But it's gone from, you know, 1.2%, 1.3% annually to like one6 So it's, it's going in the right direction. But... What you're telling me, Nishan, and I don't want the audience to miss this, you've told me this before, but actually, is that, is that if all those people do better, the net result is we run out of resources four times over. Uh, and therefore, it's not about sort of, it, on some level, the desire to raise a standard of living for all is fundamentally uh, up against a constraint around resources and how we use them. And not that we couldn't come up with future technologies, living buildings made from coral that grow themselves, where everything is sustainable, and and we reuse our resources. Not the, necessarily the mass, but it's the way we're using them today that makes that so incredibly impossible, even to even to desire for the world. Yeah, that's fascinating. I I wish there was a way that we could identify um, how emotional and mental freedom can be uh, captured and defined, and how there are so many, well, a tremendous amount of people on this planet today who are living with generational trauma, and how we can heal that generational trauma and uh, identify that we've healed that successfully. Um, I don't know how that's articulated or defined. I think that's a great point. Not, yeah. not just trauma, but also generational aspiration. So to, going back to, to Po and Nishan's point, a Delhi boy today dreams of an Audi while my friends in Frankfurt go to yoga class cook Indian food and ride their bikes to work. <laughs> and it's, it's this dreams of a generation which they thought were possible that will not be satiated, right? If the world has to be sustainable and going back to trauma, going back to our past, how, how, how do we create an emotional baseline for our generation? For our previous generation, it was, I would say, the abolition of slavery was a defining baseline that set the that was undeniable to everyone. Uh, what would that look like for our generation is is something I, I invite that because if it weren't for that, I would be in Mauritius working on a tea farm, and I wouldn't be sitting in this room. 
right? So there has to be a baseline, and I just don't know what that is. So emotions are a big part of it. So thank you, Maya, for bringing that up. So in terms of a hallmark of our times, uh, or the changing you know, hallmark of our times, might be, I think, uh, a tr you know, tr transitioning from short-termism to a greater appreciation of the long term, and well, just time scales in general when you need to accomplish big goals. And uh, I mean, obviously, we have so many uh, large objectives as a species ahead of us if we wish to survive in some comfort. Uh, but I think a lot of what ills us right now is the quarterly quarterly financial report. And you know, there's one example, but this short-term incentivization. And a great example of that uh, is the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and I'm I'm leaving aside for the moment manufacturing generic pharmaceuticals. But if you if you look at pharma companies that are doing basic research discovery. So they go from first concept to, you know, through the whole development or discovery and development pipeline to bring, you know, small molecules or antibodies of therapeutic value to the market. And now, of course, we're seeing even engineered cells. Um, and, uh, and this is great. I mean, this, the, the work is good. The problem is the scientists don't run those companies the accountants run those companies, or the development executives. And so programs that took 15 or 20 years to build and are close to bearing fruit in, say, the area of infectious diseases, multi-drug resistant bacteria, the plug can be pulled on them for short-term financial incentives. And what was lost is it's not even calculable. And so I think that to achieve, to solve difficult problems, I see evidence in what's written in, in, the, in the mass media even um, that people are beginning to rebel against sh this excessive short-termism. And so I hope that a sign of our times is uh, people collectively in all different areas, and in science too, thinking about, okay, I can, make, I can contribute part of a 20-year experiment or a 20-year series of, of experiments and developments that will make the world better and, and that's, that's, a, that's a good use of my time and effort. Uh, I don't care about quarterly profits. So, anyway. And let's, let's wrap on this question, which is, this is actually really close to the heart at IndieBio. I'm a huge fan of this. 50 years from now, what will the kids say, I can't believe you were fucking doing that? And, for the example at Indiebio that's so close to my heart is the billions of animals that we're slaughtering on the planet for food when we're pursuing growing meat in bioreactors in our future. Another example are these gorgeous coral reefs around the planet that are under destruction. Maya as well with how I can't believe you weren't mapping your mental states. I can't believe you were just self-dealing pharmaceuticals into people's throats. So I'm, I'm really curious. 50 years from now, what will the kids be saying, I can't believe you were fucking doing that? Letting the North Pole burn, you mean? <laughs> I, uh, so I could say things like, I can't believe that you used to try to treat people's brains without looking at their brains. Um, <laughs> but um, I will just caution that I, I don't believe we can even whether you look a linear or exponential model to predict the future that it is going to work out like that one of the things is that all of the unseen unknown undiscovered technologies that nobody has seen none of us on the panel have seen or even thought of and how they will disrupt things will come to bear to change things, um, as well as economic systems, hopefully. And uh, you know, I like to say I I spent in my years before coming to New Bio, I was doing futurism, helping corporate venture at times, and doing some sustainability work. And I would I was doing a lot of lucid dreaming, and I would get up in the morning and then go back to sleep and I would play this game of chess set in the year 2030 
uh, and there were five players, so five player chess, and one player was climate change, and one was AI and inequality, and one was genomics revolution, and one was China, and one was savage in income inequality, and I would try to play out what was going to happen, and I was desperate to try to figure out the future. And uh, coming here and being with Arvind, and it was surprising that IndieBio, I found out that's why I, I can come in as strategy director because actually they haven't been planning for all of that. They're, they're really focused on experimenting and reacting very, very fast, finding what works and what doesn't work, and funding the ones that work and keep going. And it, it came out to me in this phrase, which is I, I understand that hunger for a plan, but that I ended up saying to seize this opportunity, there is no plan just a way. There is no plan, just a way. And that if you pursue the way, you will end up with what in retrospect was a good plan. But if you try to plan your way through all this unknown, there's no way that plan is gonna work. Um, so in terms of the values, I think it's interesting what you said about vegetarianism um, and, and that value. So um, I think some, some of you may have heard me speak before. And we've, I've talked in a modern era about four, the four industrial revolutions and we're in the you know, fourth modern industrial revolution right now. And if you think about the industrial revolutions, they weren't about the widgets and the gadgets as how we moved from kind of steam or wind to steam, steam to oil. It was about the institutions and the value systems that pervaded ourselves at the time. So if you think about the 1750s to the 1850s, that was an era of colonialism, of empire. Um, the time of kind of conquest of the East, of Africa, of Latin America. Um, and so you know, value systems like slavery was prevalent at the time. It took an act of leadership around the 1850s around the world in order to bring about an end of slavery in, in many regions of the world, in the British, French, Spanish, and obviously in, in, in the US as well. And then if you look from the 1850s to the 1950s, that next industrial revolution, um, as we, we moved into the, the, the 20th century, uh, we had the horrors of the two world wars. You know, the first, the, the failed League of Nations and the United Nations, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt with the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights after the, you know, the horrors of the Holocaust. But that again brought the world together around a certain set of values. And so those values kind of pervaded. And then as we move from the 1950s through to the 2000s, that third industrial revolution as the oil multinationals started to expand, um, that was the first time the satellite era started. So in 1968, I know we're going to celebrate Apollo 11 soon, but 1968, Earthrise, the first time um, a, a, a satellite left Earth orbit, took an image of the Earth. And that was the birth of the modern environmental movement. You know, WWF was created in 1968, Greenpeace in 1972. A lot of the environmental movement, uh, Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring came out in the, uh, around that era as well. And so that value systems around the environment came about and we started bringing about legislation you know, to protect whaling, for example, to prevent DDT. Um, you know, and, and so that has taken us up to this point. And so as we look now and say, okay, for the next 50 years, that fourth industrial revolution is the era of, kind of um, biological advancement, um, you know, digital advancement, robotics, new materials. Um, what's going to bring about a, a consensus? We're already seeing a consensus around plastics and around environment. We're seeing a broad consensus, consensus around um, around climate. Um, I think there are, and, you know, and then some of our institutions are already being uh, challenged, uh, our democratic institutions. Um, so I think you're right that when you look at this, um, the question is, um, is this something that's gonna be created centrally or will there be technologies that we develop um, that could actually shift our value systems in ways that we cannot expect today? Um, so just as the satellite took that image of the Earth, had no, um, I can't remember the name of the astronaut who took, maybe one of you guys would remember, the astronaut who took the image uh, of Earth in 1968. Um, but they had no idea that that was going to lead to a profound environmental movement um, in the same way that we've seen um, you know, those who fought against Tiananmen Square or um, some of the declarations uh, that have been made, how this has had a profound impact. So it could actually be technology that shifts our value system in the most profound way, in ways that we can't uh, can't assess today. So that that could be where your know, hope would lie. I hope um, that in fifty years the children will say, "I can't believe you didn't listen to nature. I can't believe you didn't tune in and see what was going on around you." And I actually believe that nature is speaking now and. Um, we're going to be seeing a lot more of her intelligence as we progress. 
Yeah, some of the indigenous tribes even say it's having an allergic reaction right now to the humans. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I would hope that in the next children in the 50 years from now would look back and, and be really shocked how gen we are so gendered and uh, we have we are not safeguarding rights of people that don't fit into bi binary genders and sexuality norms. So I, I really do hope personally that there's a shift away from that and and children are disgusted by, by how we treat some genders and norms set around gender and sexuality still. It is 2019, yeah. Looking at this question, I mean, there's so many potential answers, but the one that, that came to mind was I think children are going to wonder why we allowed ourselves to be so digitally manipulated, and I don't mean digitally as in fingers, digits, but you know, electronically, digitally. Uh, <laughs> but uh, oh, that is a bad. Well, anyway, but uh, uh, the um, well, maybe both. But uh, I think that uh, that that we our thinking is fragmented, and I'm guilty of this too. I mean, I think many of us experience this. Yeah. You're, on, you're on your corporate email at strange hours of the night because you sleep with your phone because it also has an alarm clock function. Um, <laughs> and you, know, you have you know, Slack and, and other message you know, uh, apps. And, uh, and it's convenient. I mean, it, it certainly helps things, but I, I think we immensely overuse it. And I think it's, it's bad for areas like science, like policy making. You need time to free associate, I think, and, and, and bring together disparate you know, viewpoints, but also disparate uh, pieces of information in your mind. And if you're interrupted every few seconds by your watch vibrating on your wrist telling you that someone posted something on Instagram, or you, know, you have an email from your boss at 2.30, in the morning, uh, you know, this, this is not conducive to good thinking. And I think that we don't need just good thinking among leaders. We need good quality thinking among all of the people on earth. People need to be able to think deeply about important issues and not be so distracted. And so when I look at what our descendants will say, if, if we have any, uh, which hopefully we will, uh, is why did they let themselves be so distracted and, 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 and moreover, distracted uh, to generate profit um, for some companies that say that they're helping humanity but really aren't. So. And because Aza wasn't able to join us in the Center for Humane Technology, I'll speak on behalf of one of their main pillars of ethos, which is that if you um, take these institutions that have these business plans that are in the form of self-dealing as much of your attention onto the device as possible, they're trained on billions of psychometric profiles of people from around the world. And that sort of computing power targeted at your face, it, we need to humble ourselves and turn off our notifications turn off our, um, our ringers and uh, take these long periods of time like the geniuses did in the past to just free associate um, in nature um, all these different types of things. So um, this has been such a beautiful conversation. Thank you everyone for joining us on the panel. Thank you our audience. We'll have a Q&A portion now. Let's get a round of applause. Woo!